But ultimately, of course, as scientists or even as philosophers, we want to understand, well, what is it about a piece of matter like the brain that in principle has to obey the same laws of physics as any other piece of matter? It's a piece of furniture of the universe, if you want. What is it about this piece of matter that gives rise to this experience? Because experience seems to defy the conventional. It's a huge challenge to, to science, because if you look at the foundational equations of physics, quantum mechanics and general relativity, you look at the periodic table of chemistry, you look at the endless ATGC charter of the nucleotides in our genes, well, nowhere there is consciousness. But here I am, I wake up every morning, I'm not there, and suddenly I'm there. I have memories, I know what I have to do, I, have, I may have some feelings in my body because I didn't sleep enough or whatever, but I have experiences. And that's the question, how do those experiences get into the world? Welcome to Brain Science, the podcast that explores how recent discoveries in neuroscience are unraveling the mystery of how our brain makes us human. I'm your host, Dr. Ginger Campbell, and this is episode 163. My guest today is Dr. Christoph Koch, who is currently the chief scientist and president of the Allen Institute for Brain Science. We'll be talking about his newest book, The Feeling of Life Itself, Why Consciousness is Widespread but Can't Be Computed. Before we jump into the interview, I want to remind you that you can get complete show notes and episode transcripts at my website at brainsciencepodcast.com. You can send me email at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com. You can post voice feedback at speakpipe.com forward slash Doc Artemis, and you can also post to our Brain Science Podcast fan page on Facebook. And don't forget that you can subscribe to Brain Science for free in your favorite podcasting app. I'll be back after the interview to review the key ideas and to share a few brief announcements. One more thing. This is the final in our four-part series about the neuroscience of consciousness. If you've listened to the other parts of the series, you will appreciate that Dr. Koch's ideas are significantly different from some of my other guests. But don't worry, if you are new to brain science, you can enjoy this episode all on its own. I do encourage you to go back and enjoy episode 160 through 162, which is the rest of our special series about the neuroscience of consciousness. Okay, Christoph, it is fantastic to finally have you back on Brain Science after all these years. Thank you very much, Ginger, for having me on your show. Glad to be here. Since some of my listeners haven't been listening all these years, I thought maybe we would start out by letting them have some background. I know that you've been the chief science officer at the Allen Institute for Brain Science for several years. Would you take us back to earlier in your career and tell us about how you got interested in consciousness? Yeah, so my background is in physics and philosophy, particular philosophy in mind. So I've always been interested where that voice inside my head that light inside my skull comes from. And I had a, I gotten a minor in philosophy. But then I, in my focus on my um, day-to-day work as a, what's today called a computational neuroscientist, where when I was at MIT at the Artificial Intelligence Lab and then early on at Caltech as a young assistant professor, I focused on trying to model the nervous system In particular, it's neurons. So I'm I'm one of the specialists who does computer simulation of the behavior of individual neurons or of large ensembles, large groups of nerve cells when they become active, particularly in the visual system. In the late 80s, once I came to Caltech in Pasadena, Southern California, I met Francis Crick, who, of course, is the molecular biologist turned neurobiologist who co-discovered the double helical structure of DNA, the molecule of heredity, together with uh, Jim Watson, and they got the Nobel Prize for that. And I had moved, when he retired from England, from the MRC in Cambridge, England, to the Salk Institute for Biological Studies in La Jolla in Southern California. And both he and I were very interested in understanding consciousness, here defined as any experience, so 
seeing something, hearing something, being angry, feeling in love, being upset, knowing that I'm going to die one day, knowing what I had for breakfast this morning. Those are all different conscious states. And we felt, shockingly, almost all neuroscience scientists themselves or theories of neuroscience or textbooks of neuroscience completely left out what it is to actually be the owner of a brain. Because if you have a brain, a functioning brain, and you're awake like I am and like you are, and presumably like the listener is, then you actually have these experiences. As I said, you hear a voice inside your head right now. You know, my voice, my sort of Germanic flavored voice. And it's utterly unclear how that voice gets there. It is sort of understandable how I can process my brain or the brain of a simpler animal like a mouse or dog can take input sounds and translate them into output sounds. We can understand that using good old science and engineering, in fact, tools like Alexa, that's what they do. But it's a very different matter to understand where that actual experience of hearing something, you know, it feels like something to hear something, it feels like something to see something, where that experience comes from. That is the heart of the classical conceived mind-body problem. And then Francis Crick, and you together were searching for the neural correlates of consciousness. Yes, that's correct. And so this is now a sort of a standard part of the field in, as part of neuroscience or cognitive neuroscience or psychology to look for what is called the neuronal correlates of consciousness. And, and we inaugurated that study, which is what are the minimal physical or biophysical or neuronal mechanisms that are jointly necessary for anyone conscious perception. So when I hear that voice, what is it in my brain that sort of switches? Which of those different neurons or brain regions are really essential for me to hear that voice? Not to process it, not necessarily to push a button to say I heard it or I didn't hear it, not necessarily for me to speak, those are all other actions, but actually to have that experience of hearing or seeing or smelling or touching or any of these experiences. And so this is now a very active area where people are trying to come up with experiments using both normal subjects, volunteers that you put inside magnetic scanners, or patients who may have various pathologies of consciousness. They may be locked in, or they may be in a coma, or in a persistent vegetative state, or in a minimal conscious state, or animals like monkeys or mice, to try to track down the footprints of consciousness as it were in the tangle of the neuronal networks of the brain? What are the essential causal actors that are necessary for any one of these subjects to hear, to see, to experience? But in your new book, you really want to go beyond that, correct? So I do talk about in this new book, The Feeling of Life Itself, I do talk a little bit about the real progress that's happened in that field. So we now know it's really the cortex, the outermost layer, sort of the outermost shell of the brain it's sort of like a pizza, roughly the size of a pizza, 14 inch, roughly the thickness of a pizza, two to three millimeters. It's highly convolved. And you have two of them, the left hemisphere and the right cortical hemisphere, and they all fit inside your skull. And it's part of this tissue that is the most complex piece of highly organized active matter in the known universe that gives rise to consciousness. And ultimately, yes, neurologists, clinical people, neuroscientists will track down sort of the, uh, the layer to the prey, the neural correlates of consciousness, to its layer in those highly entangled sets of neurons somewhere in the cerebral cortex. On the one hand, this is fantastic progress. So then we can say these neurons, whenever you activate these neurons, you see, a, you see you know, mom's face. Whenever you activate those neurons, you hear her voice, whether or not she's present. In fact, if I artificially turn on those neurons, a device or the surgeon's electrodes or some fancy optogenetics, you will hear your mom's voice even though she isn't there. So there's no doubt that scientists will establish this close one-to-one -one correspondence between a particular experience and a particular part of the brain that seems to be tightly linked to that. That's cool. There'll be Nobel Prizes and editorials and uh, many books written about it, and this is going to help us in determining, for example, what goes wrong in schizophrenia when people hear a voice but there isn't actually a voice present, at least in the outside world, or in depression, when everything sort of is leached of meaning, or in autism, or in we will be able to understand, well, at what point are babies actually conscious? Are they conscious when they're born? Do they become conscious afterwards? Are they already conscious in utero? So we'll be able to answer some of those questions. But ultimately, of course, as scientists, 
or even as philosophers, we want to understand, well, what is it about a piece of matter like the brain that in principle has to obey the same laws of physics as any other piece of matter? It's a piece of furniture of the universe, if you want. What is it about this piece of matter that gives rise to this experience? Because experience seems to defy the conventional. It's a huge challenge to, to science, because if you look at the foundational equation of physics, quantum mechanics and general relativity, you look at the periodic table of chemistry, you look at the endless ATGC charter of the nucleotides in our genes, well, nowhere there is consciousness. But here I am, I wake up every morning, I'm not there, and suddenly I'm there. I have memories, I know what I have to do, I, have, I may have some feelings in my body because I didn't sleep enough or whatever, but I have experiences. And that's the question, how do those experiences get into the world? The neural correlates don't answer the question of why we have experience. That's correct. They answer the question, what are some of the physical or the biological or the neurological determinant? But they don't answer why in the sense of how. How does it arise? What is its function? So why in the teleonomical sense? You know, what, what's the purpose of, of consciousness, um, if any? And also, it's very difficult without having a fundamental understanding of consciousness to answer a question like, can a bee be conscious? A bee has a brain that's very different than yours and my brain. So in a monkey, most people that work with monkeys can accept that the monkey is also conscious. It may not have a voice in its head because, you know, monkeys don't talk, certainly not in the way that we do. But there's no doubt that if you interact with monkeys or with cats and dogs, that they can be happy, they can be depressed, they can be anxious, they can be fearful. But the farther you move away from us, evolutionary speaking, like, for example, a bee or a squid, totally foreign intelligence of very different being, are they conscious? And how do I know? And then, of course, the great challenge of our age is, can machines be conscious? For sure, we accept now more and more they can be intelligent to greater or lesser extent, maybe even superhuman intelligent in the fullness of time. But does that intelligence go hand in hand with any experience? Or are they just glorified dishwasher and garbage disposal units that can do complicated things but without there being anybody home. That's the great challenge that we're facing moving forward over the next century. Or Also, it doesn't answer the question, how low does consciousness go? There's this ancient belief, both in the West and in the East, in Buddhism, called pan-psychism. The belief that psyche, soul, is possibly everywhere, pan, pan-psychism. So the idea is that maybe all of biology is in mind. It. Maybe a tree feels like something. Maybe a little bacteria feels an itsy-bitsy bit like something. Or some people say, well, maybe consciousness is fundamental to matter. Maybe one way to resolve this dilemma is by saying, well, consciousness is part of the universe. It's a fundamental aspect of reality. And so ultimately, to answer all those questions that many people want to answer, we need a fundamental theory of consciousness. And I've been working with a colleague. He's an Italian-American neuroscientist and psychiatrist, Giulio Tononi at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And he, he's devised a theory called Integrated Information Theory, or IIT. And I've been working closely with him over the past 20 years to, to look at the implication of this Integrated Information Theory. What are the implications of, for testing for consciousness in in patients that anesthetize, they may be conscious, but they're unable to tell us because they're also simultaneously paralyzed. Or patients that may be neurologically impaired because they're in a minimal conscious state due to stroke or an accident. Or children or uh, psychiatric patients to devise tools to test consciousness, but also to, to discuss the implications of consciousness. To what extent does it exist in other creatures and in computers? Would you like to give us an overview of this integrated information theory of consciousness? It really goes back to certain Aristotelian notions. Plato really discussed these also. Ultimately, what exists, well, let's take a step back. How do you know anything exists? So in science, we believe something exists to the extent that it exerts causal power over other things. Right, so the, to the extent that gravity exists because it exerts causal power on anything else that has mass. Electricity exists because it exerts power over other charged particles. I exist in a sense I can push a book around, I can push furniture around, and you can push back. And this is a general principle. To the extent that things have causal power, we assume they exist. 
if things don't have any causal power, they can be influenced by anything and they cannot influence anything in turn, then why possibly they exist then? They don't make a difference to the universe and therefore we don't believe that they exist. IIT really says fundamentally what consciousness is, it's the ability of any physical system to exert causal power upon itself. So it's really, it's an Aristotelian uh, really notion of causality to the extent that the present state of my brain can determine one of a trillion future states of my brain. And to the extent that one of the trillion of states in the immediate past of my brain can help determine my current state, it has causal power. And the more it has the ability to be influenced by its immediate past and to influence its future, intrinsic causal power, the more it exists. And that's ultimately what consciousness is. I know this sounds very airy-fairy, but it has a number of very concrete consequences because in principle, you can measure this causal power. If I'm looking at a particular system, let's see a, a computer, a CPU, with some transistors on and some transistors off, in principle, if I have a, a mathematical description or physical description of that particular computer with some charge and some gates being switched on, I can then determine how much it is going to influence its own future. Likewise, I can do it for any brain or I can do it for any physical system. And the theory says the exact causal, the exact amount of causal power upon itself, it calls that, it's a number, it calls it by the Greek number phi. So that's a measure of how much things exist for themselves, not for others, but for themselves. Because my consciousness exists for itself. It doesn't depend on you. It doesn't depend on my parents. It doesn't depend on anybody else but me. So phi characterizes the degree to which the system exists for itself. If it's zero, the system doesn't exist. The bigger this number, the more the system exists for itself, the more it is conscious in that sense. And also the type and quality of conscious experience. Red feels different from blue. Colors feel different from seeing something in motion. Seeing feels different from smelling. That feels very different from being in love or being angry. Those are all different conscious experiences. And the exact character of every one conscious experience is determined by the by the extent and the quality of the causal power that the system has upon itself. And so the theory, in principle, is computable. It says for any particular physical system, like my brain or your brain or the brain of the Bernese mountain dog that just came rushing into here, my dog Felix, or a computer for that matter, you look for the structure within that brain or the CPU that has sort of maximal causal power. That is a structure that ultimately constitutes the physical basis of consciousness of that particular creature, whether it's a dog or a human or a computer. So in principle, the theory lets you, unlike a mere philosophical theory, lets you very precisely define what are its correlates, its neuronal correlates if it's a brain, or its physical correlates if it's something non-organic, that give rise to any one conscious experience. I want to take a moment to tell you about one of my favorite apps. It's called Text Expander, and it's available for Mac, Windows, iOS, and even Chrome. You create snippets of just about anything that you can think of, and then you can easily insert them anywhere, including web browsers, email, social media, and so much more. No more typing the same thing over and over. Text Expander is especially useful for sharing your favorite links. If you haven't tried it yet, just go to textexpander.com forward slash podcast to get 20% off your first year. Be sure to tell them that you heard it on Brain Science. That's textexpander.com forward slash podcast. Christoph, I'm sure that many of my listeners are wondering, how does the integrated information theory relate to panpsychism? Are they interchangeable? No, no. It shares some intuition, but it also differs. So, for instance, philosophically, one of the great problems of panpsychism is what's called the superposition problem. You are conscious. I'm conscious. Panpsychism would say, well, so there should also be an uber-consciousness that's you and me. But I have no experience of that. You have no experience uh, uh, with that. 
But this is the problem with time psychism. If it says everything is conscious, well, then every particle of my body should be should have its own consciousness. Plus, there's my consciousness. Plus, there's the consciousness of me and the microphone, and then me and you, and me and my wife, and or me in America, right? There's 312 million Americans, but there isn't anything what it feels like to be America. This has always been the the big one of the Achilles heel of pan psychism. IET solves this by saying. Only the maximum of this measure called integrated information exists. So locally, there's a maximum within my brain. There's a maximum in your brain. Now, of course, we interact. We talk, you ask me a question, I answer it. We can go back and forth. So we do exchange some information right through the microphone and over the internet, etc. But the amount of causal interaction we have on each other is minute and is dwarfed by the massive amount of causal interaction within my brain and within your brain. Therefore, there's you and there's me, but there isn't anything what it feels like to be Ginger Christoph. But now the theory also says, ha, being a scientific theory, I can make the following prediction. Let's start running some wires between your brain and my brain. Now, I can begin to do this in experimental animals, like in mice, but not really at scale yet. And right now we can't do it in humans. But let's imagine, I'm sort of building, um, well, uh, your viewers may probably well know, between my left brain and my right brain, the left cortical hemisphere and the right cortical hemisphere, there are these 200 million fibers, they're called the corpus callosum. They connect the left brain and the right brain. And if you cut them, as a neurosurgeon will do to prevent seizures, epileptic seizures from spreading from one hemisphere into the other, you get what's called a split brain syndrome, right? You get the, the left hemisphere that can talk and the right hemisphere that's also conscious, but is mute. So in that case, you have two conscious entities inside one skull. Well, let's do the opposite experiment. Let's sort of build an artificial corpus callosum between your brain and my brain. First, let's just add a few wires between my, let's say, visual brain and your visual brain. Early on, what will happen I will see what I see, whatever I'm looking at. But then because I'm now, I have access to a few neurons in your visual brain, superimposed, there will be some, you know, there will be a ghostly image of what you see. I will have access to some of the same information that you have access to. But you're still you and I'm still me. There's no confusion about it. As I add more and more wires between my brain and your brain, the theory says there will be a precise point in time when the integrated information across this let's call it Ginger Christoph entity, will exceed the integrated information within my brain or within your brain. At that abrupt point, when that happens, you will disappear, the ginger will be gone, will be dead, Christoph will be dead, and there will be this new conscious entity that's some amalgamation, some combination of you and me, of your perception, of my perception, of your memories, of my memories. It will be one entity, one conscious mind with two brains, with two mouths, with four ears, with four eyes, etc. It's a little bit like the Borg, except now it's a mini Borg. It's just <laughs> you and me. I know that you've been very devoted to exploring this particular approach, and there's a lot of other approaches like, for example, the global neuronal workspace theory. What is it about this approach that really feels right to you that makes you feel that it's the best approach? Okay, so that's that's a good question. We can also talk about the dominant competing theory. So today in the scientific space, idea space, there are really two dominant theories. There's integrated information theory that I just talked about, and then there's global neuronal workspace theory. So global neuronal workspace theory differs it only claims to talk about those aspects of consciousness that you can actually speak about. It's called access consciousness. So whenever you know I look at something and I can describe it, I can see right now I'm looking at this Thai statue of the dancer and she has yellow hair and a red jacket on, etc. So I can describe that. And a global neuron works because it seeks to describe the neuronal events that underlie that perception. And it says what happens is that all that information, once it becomes conscious, it gets written on a, onto a general workspace inside the brain. I mean, it's a conceptual workspace and gets broadcast to all the other parts of the brain. So once I'm conscious of something, I can talk about it. I can put it in my memory banks. I can reason with it. 
you know, my entire brain has access to that information. If it's not conscious, particular parts of the brain can access that information, but it remains unconscious or subconscious if you want. So the theories have different interpretation which part of cortex are critically involved. And there's now an, a large-scale experiment called an adversarial collaboration that I'm in uh, part of, where proponents of integrated information theory and global neuronal workspace theory have gotten together to agree to disagree in a sense that we've come up with a large-scale set of experiments that's being funded now and that's starting now using fMRI and EG and clinical measures where we commit ourselves ahead of time, both sides, that if the outcome of this experiment goes this way, then this will support integrated information theory. If the outcome of the experiments go that way, then it'll support global neuronal workspace theory. That's what we need, right? In principle, most people tell me this is exactly how science works. Unfortunately, in practice, <laughs> very often, particularly in biology, people pursue their own ideas and never test anybody else's idea. Furthermore, most of the data isn't made accessible. So if somebody else wants to test and say, wait, can I look at your data and make my own analysis? People get freaked out. So here we're trying to do this very different. We all agree on these experiments ahead of time. We're going to do them. We're going to upload them to the cloud. Anybody can access this data. If you don't believe me, well, here's the data. Just, you know, run your own statistical test on it. Yes. Yeah, so we need much more of these adversarial collaboration, but they're not easy because now you have to agree and people, of course, uh, can disagree quite strongly, and then you have to agree on a set of experiment that will be relevant both for theory one and for theory two. And in principle, this should be easy. In practice, it's very difficult. Now, the two theories, however, disagree more fundamentally. So the, the question about what are the neuronal correlates, that's a question we all agree on. Sooner or later, we'll resolve it. It'll be either one theory is right or the other theory is right, or maybe both theories are wrong and there'll be something else that's even better. But, but this is a question we all agree that we can answer sooner or later. The theory, integrated information theory, also has built this tool called Zap and Zip to test the presence of consciousness, for example, in patients who are anesthetized or may only be partially anesthetized and you don't know whether there's anybody home or the theory also predicts whether pe like severely disabled patient, like, like in a lock-in state or in a minimal conscious state, are conscious or not, whether it's actually anybody home or not. So these are all scientific questions that will have precise answers in the fullness of time. Where the theories disagree is the fundamental nature of consciousness. Global neuronal workspace embodies the dominant zeitgeist the dominant zeitgeist in Silicon Valley, in the tech industry, in the movie, in Hollywood, in, in movies like, you know, Black Mirror and the Westworld and Ex Machina, Blade Runner, you know, et cetera, et cetera, that if you just build enough intelligence into a machine, into a computer, if you add feedback and you add self-monitoring and you add speaking like in Alexa, ultimately, sooner or later, you will not only get to a system that's intelligent, but you will also get to a system that's conscious because they are really very, very closely related. That ultimately consciousness is all about behavior. It's sort of a distant descendant of behaviorism. That scientifically, the only thing you can really speak about, properly speak about and discuss and test is behavior. And that's the only thing that matters for the survival of any organism. And that's what we can build into machines. And so therefore, ultimately, to the extent that our machines will become smarter and more intelligent, they will become more conscious. And it's just a question of time before consciousness arises in some, you know, Alexa 20.0 down the road. The consciousness ultimately is just a clever hack away. It's just a question of doing the right computer program, you know, in the right way, this thing will be conscious. That's the dominant view in Anglo-Saxon philosophy circles and in the tech industry, and as I said, that's a zeitgeist. The other view is that, no, ultimately, consciousness, it's not magical. In a sense, it's natural. It's a natural property of certain systems, like my brain. So it doesn't depend on any supernatural, like a soul. Scientists and philosophers, by and large, don't believe that anymore. And that assumption that there isn't a soul has served us extremely well over the last 300 years of enlightenment. Integrated information theory says ultimately it's about causal power. So to the extent that you can build a system that has that causal power, that system will be conscious. But you cannot simulate it. 
just like you can't, you can simulate a rainstorm, you can simulate a um, hurricane, like the hurricane that just devastated the Bahamas, but you never have to worry that your computer is going to be destroyed by the winds. You never have to go worry that the computer is going to get wet inside when it's simulating a rainstorm. When they do these weather predictions, the computer doesn't get wet. Well, you have to think about it. Why not? I mean, that seems like a silly question. It's actually a pretty deep one. The difference between the real and the synthetic, the simulated. Why is it not wet inside an otherwise perfect weather simulation? Same thing. You can build. There's no question that ultimately we will be able to simulate a human brain. If we do it good enough with best state-of-the-art knowledge, we'll be able to simulate in principle the entire human brain, including its speech. And of course, the simulation will say it's conscious because that's what people do. If you ask them, do you feel, do you see, you say, yeah, of course I see and I feel. And this computer simulation will say that, but it's all fake. It's all a deep fake because ultimately that's just the behavior. And just like it doesn't get wet inside a numerical weather simulation of a weather storm, it won't get conscious just because you simulated a human on a programmable computer. What you have to do, and some people are trying to do it, but it's much more challenging, you have to build a computer in the image of the brain with massive overlapping connectivity. You know, one neuron is connected to 50 or 100,000 other neurons. They have massively overlapping input. They have massively overlapping output. It's very different from the way CPUs or ALUs or TPUs are built in the computer industry, where typically you have three or four gates, transistors that are wired to one transistor. There isn't a lot of overlap. So ultimately, you have to build conscious power. Ultimately, you know, you have to build into the physics of the system. So do you think that if we actually did build it correctly, could we then build consciousness according to IIT or is it yes. theoretical? But it would have to be very different from the way it's currently imagined. Correct. It would have to be what people call neuromorphic computing. So there are some people like IBM, for instance, and some academic researchers are trying to build hardware, you know, silicon hardware, that's at the level of the gate, at the actual level of the metal, the transistors, et cetera, that is much more like brains with synapses and thousands of synapses converging onto one neuron, similar to the way brain works. And that, in principle, would have human or mouse level or whatever, depending on the, the exact character of what you're building, uh, consciousness. So once again, there's nothing supernatural about consciousness. It's a physical property, ultimately, Consciousness is a property of certain physical systems, just like their stiffness, their mass, their energy content, so is consciousness. Certain physical systems, like my brains, have a lot of it. It feels like something to be my brain. The brain of my guard dog also feels like something, but less. It, it can make less distinction. You know, The brain of a, of a bee also feels like something, but it's even less. So it, it, you know, it goes down with the complexity of these uh, systems. But in principle, the theory says many physical systems, even non-evolved physical systems, may well feel like something. That intuition is also shared by panpsychism. So do you think that a single cell or an atom could be conscious? In the limit, it may well feel like something to be, for example, a bacteria. We just talk about biological matter. In the sense that bacteria doesn't have a psychology, it doesn't feel fat or obese or hungry, or, but a single bacteria has already a few billion molecules of maybe a few thousand different proteins. No one has ever modeled all the vast complexity inside a single amoeba or a single protozoa. It's already highly, highly complex. And IT says, at least in principle, it may well feel a little bit like something. And then when the bacteria is dissolved into its constituents component, when it, quote, dies, it doesn't feel like anything anymore. Yes, so in that sense, even very simple systems may feel like something. In fact, it may well be possible that most systems that are alive, most biological systems on this planet, may feel like something. Beginning back to when you imagined that we were melding our brains together. So if I look at something like the mitochondria inside my cells, these, according to, if I understand what you said before, any consciousness that they have has been subsumed into mine? 
Correct. That's an excellent observation. Yes. So the theory says you're always looking at all the physical system from the scale of molecules to mitochondria to other cellular organelles to individual neurons to groups of neurons to your entire brain. We ask, what is the structure that maximizes this integrated information? Now, if there would be a mitochondria by itself, it might have a little bit of phi. But that mitochondria is part of a much larger whole, namely your, your entire cortex, and that's what constitutes your consciousness. So the theory says for itself, only your sort of big brain-based consciousness exists. Now, it may be possible if I disassemble your brain, let's say in death when you die and your brain dissembles, that some of the individual neurons for, you know, fleeting amount of few minutes may well feel like something by themselves before they too die. So in each case, you have to ask, what is the system that maximizes the integrated information? But in principle, there's a precise answer, right? In each case, it is a particular system that will be the maximum, and only that system exists for itself. The other system exists for others. I can look at them, for instance. I can poke them. I can do experiment. I can measure them. But only the system that locally maximizes integrated information exists for itself, is a subject, and has some experience. So going back to the situation of a normal brain where both cortexes are connected to each other, they don't have separate consciousnesses at that point. But in the split brain patient, because they're not connected, they've been split in two. And that makes sense in IIT. That makes perfect. That, that's exactly what you would expect. You cut the corpus callosum, those 200 million fibers. Now, there may be another interesting case. They're twins. They're rare cases of conjoined twins. I'm thinking of now two girls up in British Columbia that were born. They had a birth defect. And so their brain connected at the level of the thalamus. They have a, a thalamic bridge. So the parents don't want their kids to be tested. They must be like 10 or 11 years now. Tatiana twins, I think that's what they're called. They want them to be tested. Also, you, you can't put two people simultaneously grown together at the brain, so they share part of their skull into a scanner. But there's some evidence to suggest that they share certain unconscious experiences. So, for instance, if one of the twins looks in one way, the other twin who looks away can see or at least claims to see something of what the other twins see. So that may be an instant because of these very strange brain organization in, in these conjoined twins, that they may have one experience under certain conditions. This month, our sponsor is BetterHelp, an online counseling service that features 3,000 counselors in 50 states. You can schedule sessions via secure video or phone, and you can go at your own pace. These are licensed counselors that specialize in a wide variety of issues. And of course, everything is confidential. If you aren't happy with your counselor, you can change free of charge. Online counseling is private and confidential and less time consuming than traveling to someone's office. You can do it from anywhere in the world. And BetterHelp does have financial aid for those who qualify. But note that this is not a crisis line. BetterHelp is offering a 10% discount off your first session if you use the discount code GINGER, G-I-N-G-E-R. So to get started today, just go to betterhelp.com forward slash GINGER. When you go there, you'll fill out a questionnaire to help them figure out your needs and get you matched with the right person. That's betterhelp.com forward slash GINGER. In the book, you talk about the zip and zap technique and its application to trying to figure out whether people that, that appear to be unconscious actually have some meaningful consciousness going on. And, and this is, you know, a big clinical question now. In Stanislav Dehan's book, he also talks about using his theory for that purpose. Could you explain how those measurement techniques are? I understand they're fundamentally different, but... No, they're not that. I mean, both cases, there's this uh, operational questions, and there are now thousands of patients to which this applies. It's not that rare in emergency rooms, in, um, you know, critical care facilities, in other care facilities, long-term care facilities, where you have, let's say, a severely demented patient, right, late-stage Alzheimer. Or um, you may remember Terry Schiavo, so somebody who had a stroke or an accident, and now they are, they're clearly alive, 
they in what's called a persistent vegetative state where they have periods of eye opening and periods of eye closing, but you, they're unable to signal either because there's no one home anymore or because they want to signal desperately, but their motor structure, say they have the motor cortex and premotor cortex, et cetera, have been destroyed. So they can't indicate by eye movements or shaking their head or, or moving their fingers or talking. They're unable to do that. So that there's an urgent clinical need to tell, are these patients conscious or not? Not are they alive? And then their patients routinely, you know, they are, each day there are roughly 10,000 people or 20,000 people who get anesthetized. Anesthesia doesn't work perfectly in all patients. So you really want a reliable measure that tells you, is this person right now, are they unconscious? Because that's really what you want. You don't want them to experience the trauma of major surgery. And so there you, you want a clinical procedure. And so the one that's most popular right now that's being tested also here in the U.S. in a number of clinical trials is called ZAP and ZIP. So essentially what you do, you apply a brief magnetic pulse to the skull. It's called TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, where essentially you excite the underlying neurons briefly through this magnetic pulse, and then you measure the reverberation using high-density EEG. So in a sense, it's a little bit, you take a church bell, you know, like the bell at, um, let's see, the bell of um, the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia. You hit it with a hammer, and then you're listening to its echo. If it's cracked, for instance, like the Liberty Bell famously is, it'll sound very differently compared to when it's nicely integrated. And the integrated information theory says, well, if you're conscious, your brain is going to be both highly integrated, because that reflects the character of any one conscious experience. It's an integrated whole. But it's all highly differentiated, because each experience is very particular in the way it is, and very different from every other experience you've ever had. It says this character, this phenomenological aspect of every experience to be both differentiated as well as integrated should be reflected in the underlying neurons. There's a single number that this algorithm derives called PCI, perturbational complexity index, which is a number between zero and one. It tells you how compressible the EG responses of the brain are. Now, if the brain is, let's see, in a, if you're flatlined, extreme case of a deep coma state, where the EG is pretty much flat everywhere, you can maximally compress it. There's almost no information in these EG recordings. This is where the zip comes from, zipping. Remember when you zip, when you zip a file, you compress a file. It's based on a mathematical operation called Lempel zip. And so if the brain is very simple or you're, because you're unconscious for a variety of reasons or you're in deep sleep or you anesthetize, then the brain response is much simpler than if you are conscious, either awake conscious or because you're asleep but you're dreaming, or you, let's say, you're taking ketamine drugs where you're not actually anesthetized, you're dissociated, or in various control studies where you have, uh, let's say, in stroke in various parts of the brain, but you can still respond. It turns out this zap and zip is a practical measure that can differentiate, never mind the theory, you don't have to believe the theory, this is just a practical measure that can differentiate this one patient right now in front of me. Is that patient conscious or is the patient not conscious? And right now there's no other measure, this P3B measure, so the Global Neuron Workspace has a measure called P300B. It's a particular component of an electrical evoked activity in the brain of subjects that really doesn't respond to consciousness. It responds to whether people are surprised by something. So when you get this aha experience, when something stands out, then you get this P3B, but it doesn't directly mark the presence or absence of consciousness. So right now, that's not being used in clinical study to assess, to assess the presence or absence of consciousness. Because it's not measuring the right thing. It's not directly, no, it's confounded. It's not directly measuring consciousness, correct? So that's not to say people won't find even better measures of consciousness. But right now, the one that many people are trying to use now is this um, lempel zip complexity, this zap and zip procedure. So what I like about that, some philosophers say, well, there's no progress in the mind-body problem. No, I, I beg to differ. You can now... And these techniques, these measurement techniques are getting better all the time, right? Because we understand more and more. So I think that that is significant progress, that you not only have theories that might be right or wrong, but that you can actually, based on those theories, test for the presence of consciousness or absence, at least in human patients. Christoph, is there anything else that you would like to share before we close? Ultimately, you can ask the sort of ethical implications uh, for all of this. 
this is not just sort of an intellectual um, game, because ultimately what matters to us is experience, right? If I'm not conscious, if I don't have experiences, I may as well not exist. This also has implications for looking at other things like animals or ultimately uh, computers. So why do we treat, let's say, a car? Let's say, you know, you have a Tesla and you have a dog. Those are two different things. Tesla is a means to an end. It's a means to get fast from A to B, to the end to get from A to B. Your dog may also have may, may also be a means. You know, you want him as a guard dog or for companionship, etc. But the dog also has conscious states, and therefore you can't abuse your dog. There would be legal consequences to the why, because we believe the dog is a conscious creature and therefore can suffer, and we want to minimize the suffering of all conscious creatures. Therefore, to the extent that we accept that other creatures, particular animals, particularly closely related animals like mammals, have conscious states, that means they're not just means to an end to either for cosmetic purposes, for fur, or for culinary purposes to eat them, but they should have certain rights. And of course, this is something that's emphasized by many different faiths, that we are not the only conscious creatures out there, and therefore we should act accordingly, that we are just one among many conscious creatures on this planet. So we come out in a very different position than Eckhart and his seeing animals as, as if they were machines. Yes, that's correct. Everything that, I mean, this again, we know from neuroscience. So my institute just published a very large paper in Nature two weeks ago, in which we analyzed the different types of neurons in the human brain, and we compare them against the different types of neurons in the brain of a mouse, which is the most common laboratory animal using this technique called transcriptomics, where we look at actually the genes that are expressed in the individual cells. And we find roughly there's the same number of different types of brain cells in the mouse as in the human. So the human, we get these cells from neurosurgical samples and from postmortem brain, from dead brain. In the animal, from mice, we can collect it directly. And we see it's roughly the same complexity. And we know that, I mean, the genes, there are roughly 20,000 genes in the human, there are roughly 20,000 genes in the mouse. They're roughly going to be on the order of 1,000 or 2,000 different types of neurons in the human, and there's going to be roughly the same number in the, in the mouse. So the, the hardware, if you want, is very similar. We have more of it. We have 1,000 times more than a mouse, but then there are other creatures like certain whales that have two or three times more than we do. So it's very difficult, based on any objective scientific reading, to make claims for human exceptionalism. Christoph, as you look back on your career, what's would be the biggest surprise? To biologists, it's probably trivial, but as I mentioned earlier, I come from physics. To the extent that our bodies and our brains are similar to those of other evolved creatures on this planet, at least. And to the extent, if I look at other creatures, like dogs and others, to the extent that we all share this world, the thing that's common to all of us, all of us have these experiences bookended between you know birth and and death, the beginning and the end of life. And that is something very, very precious. And, you know, the, the older I get, the more, the more I realize that this precious you know, moment of eternity that we all share, all of us, you know, no matter where we sit on the evolutionary um, tree of life. If you have just a minute, I want to ask you a question that has to do with your background as a physicist, because there's still people that are trying to say that we need to explain consciousness using quantum mechanics. What's your take on, on that? <laughs> so quantum mechanics has always had this challenge. And so from the earliest, from the first book of, of John von Neumann back in 1923, quantum physicists realized that in some sense, quantum mechanics put the observer at the center of physics. Because you observe something, and then famously the wave function collapses. And forever, for the past 100 years that quantum mechanics exist, people have been trying to understand how can that be. Isn't it true, and many physicists argue this, that consciousness really has to be part of physics? I think that's true. I think IIT is one way of doing that. It may well be possible that ultimately we need a quantum mechanical version of IIT, and there, there are some physicists who are doing that. So I have a great deal of sympathy with that. On the other hand, right now, if we just look at the brain as an experimental system that we investigate day in, day out, most of its action, 
can be understood using classical physics. Not all of it, but most of its action can be understood by classical physics. And so right now, empirically, experimentally, we don't really have evidence that, for example, to see or hear, I need quantum mechanic and macroscopic quantum mechanical effects. Although, you know, one has to be careful. It may well be true. Our knowledge, of course, is very limited, and we're learning new things about brains all the time. But right now, we don't have strong experimental evidence that things like action potential. So you may know, or your listeners may know, the basic way that neurons in brains like you and mine and mice and dogs and cats and whales communicate is by sending out these brief pulses of electric current called action potential. It's a universal idiom. And for instance, right now, we have no evidence that they rely on any sort of microscopic quantum mechanical effect. Instead, they seem to require the switching of thousands of protein molecules in the membrane using just classical physics. And so I'm a little bit skeptical right now of quantum mechanic theories of consciousness. But, you know, you have to keep an open mind. So I'm sure I've asked you this question before, but I'm still closing my interviews with asking for advice for students. In 2019, a student is interested in studying consciousness. I mean, in the last 30 years, that's become something you can study. Well, so if you're interested in it, I would say get an undergraduate degree in a rock solid sort of fundamental science like um, physics or electrical engineering or chemistry, biology, and then go on to graduate work in, you know, cognitive science, imaging, neuroscience, clinical uh, neurology, neurosurgery, some of those fields. Because they all deal in one way or the other with, with the brain, the human brain or the brain of, uh, of allied species. What do you think about the trend toward people doing their undergraduate degrees in neuroscience? So neuroscience is a very, very broad field because it goes from individual proteins all the way to whole brains over the lifetime, right? So I think it's better for people to get an undergraduate degree in really something more, more, more classical, like applied math, math, physics, basic biology, and only then specialize, only subsequently for their PhD degrees or their MD degrees, specialize in neuroscience. I think if you specialize too early on, that's my belief, I think it's, uh, it's too early specialization. In particular, it's very useful for studying consciousness or any other aspects of the brain to really have a very solid foundation in the basic physics and mathematics. You really need to understand your probability theories, your algebra, information theory, etc. So those are typically taught in some of the more basic uh, sciences. So my recommendation is always do that and then specialize in neuroscience. That's kind of what I tell people when I get, I get a lot of emails on this subject, which is why I um, ask the people who are actually in the field for their opinions. It has been really fun talking to you. I think I have a little bit of a better grasp of this than I did just from reading the book, but I think this book is a good introduction. The feeling of life itself. It was an honor to talk with Christoph Koch again. We first talked back in episode 22, which aired way back in 2007, and we also talked in 2012. So it's been fascinating to follow the evolution of his thoughts about consciousness. Early in his career, Koch worked with Nobel laureate Francis Crick, and together they pioneered the search for the neural correlates of consciousness. So it's fascinating that he now feels that the neural correlates alone are not enough to explain experience. I have to admit, I find it difficult to provide an adequate overview of integrated information theory. But Koch's new book, The Feeling of Life Itself, is an excellent introduction for readers of all backgrounds. So what exactly is the phi that integrated information theory attempts to measure? Koch explained this in non-mathematical terms by emphasizing causal efficacy or causal power, This is helpful because it actually makes intuitive sense. For example, while an individual neuron in my brain might have a tiny amount of causal power, what matters is the causal power generated by my brain as a whole. Even so, many of us feel a certain resistance to this theory because of its panpsychic implications. 
When I talked with Koch back in 2012, he seemed to embrace the panpsychic implications of IIT. But in his new book and in our conversation, he made it clear that he thinks that there are significant differences. He's not claiming that inanimate objects are conscious, but he does seem to feel that all living beings have at least the potential for measurable consciousness. It will be interesting to see how the collaboration between the IIT folks and the global neuronal workspace folks turns out. The Allen Institute has been pioneering this idea of open science, where data is made freely available on the Internet. But the other thing that's important about this is that they are agreeing ahead of time about what they will measure. The challenge, of course, is going to be designing experiments where the theories predict different results so that they can falsify one theory or the other. If you're interested in the neuroscience of consciousness, I highly recommend Christoph Koch's new book, The Feeling of Life Itself, Why Consciousness is Widespread but Can't Be Computed. It's a good introduction to integrated information theory. You would probably want to go to Tonini's work, though, if you want something with lots of math. Next month, as a part of my year-end episode, I'm going to share my reflections about the neuroscience of consciousness. Until then, I want to encourage you to listen to all four episodes in this series with a view to noticing how much diversity exists among the experts in the field. Things have certainly changed since early in Koch's career when even mentioning consciousness was considered career suicide. I would love to hear what you think about this episode and the others in the series. You can send me email at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com or submit voice feedback at speakpipe.com forward slash Doc Artemis. Of course, you can also post to the Brain Science Podcast fan page on Facebook. I hope you will visit our website brainsciencepodcast.com. Besides show notes and episode transcripts, you can sign up for the free newsletter. The advantage of this is that you get the show notes automatically every month so you'll never miss an episode. I want to thank those of you who support Brain Science financially. There's three main ways to do this. The premium subscription, which gives you access to the entire back catalog, which is over 100 episodes now, and also all the episode transcripts. So that's really popular with new listeners. Another option is Patreon, which allows you to pick how much you want to support the show by amount, whatever amount each month. That's patreon.com forward slash Doc Artemis. If you give above a minimal amount, you get the transcripts of each episode. And for people who give $10 or more a month, get ad-free episodes. If you want to make a single donation, there's still good old-fashioned PayPal, but I'm now also taking Venmo. My username on Venmo is Doc Artemis. You can see more details about all these options by going to brainsciencepodcast.com forward slash donations. I sometimes get emails from people who are apologizing for not being able to support the show. Even if you can't support the show with money. You can support the show by sharing it with others and posting reviews in your favorite podcasting apps or, you know, on social media. The more you share it, the more people will find the show. I'll be back next month with the 13th annual review episode. I usually post Brain Science on the fourth Friday of the month, but next month's episode should come out on December 20th. For those of you who like to listen during your holiday travels, thanks again for listening. I look forward to talking with you again very soon. Brain Science is a copyright 2019 to Virginia Campbell, MD. You can copy this episode to share it with others, but for any other uses or derivatives, please contact me at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com. The theme music for Brain Science is Mind Fire, written and performed by Tony Catraccia. You can find his work at syncopationnow.com.